working the shift at my work from 1 a.m. to 12 p.m. 5 p.m. was one of the times where I had a nap. It was not the time I expected to get a call from my beloved daughter, Lainey. She lived with her mother, so I never really got to see or hear from her much, except for on holidays. Concerned on why I was getting a phone call from her, I picked up the phone. Daddy, I'm stuck in a tree, she muttered. I could hear the fear in her voice and was quite concerned if this was a sick prank from her or what. She always had a sick sense of humor, so I honestly could not tell. How'd you get stuck in a tree? I asked demandingly, still a little angry as to why she would not just call her mother, who probably is up and awake right now. It was raining quite harsh, so I thought I should probably hurry. I grabbed my umbrella and headed to my car, still on the phone with her. She wasn't saying much, but I could still hear her breathing into the phone. I'd assumed she'd hang up soon, as she never really did like talking over the phone. Just one of the many traits of her, I guess. I would have loved to know how she got in the tree, but I was more intent on getting her out of it. I asked her where the address was that the tree was at, and I headed off. I wanted to get there as quick as possible, as I didn't want my only daughter to be frightened and stuck in a tree. Then I started to think about the situation a bit more, since my initial paranoia of, oh, my daughter is in a tree, I need to save her, has worn off. Wait a minute, how am I going to get you down? She gave no response. Her breathing began to get slower, quieter. I was starting to fear she had fallen out of the tree, as she was not responding. Her slow but just yet realizable breathing assured me she was okay. I still wanted to hear her voice again, just to be sure. Any fucking creep could have put her in that tree or shot her or something and be breathing into the foam. I pushed my foot down on the gas pedal, almost passing the speed limit. Lainey, please answer me, I said, worry coming from my voice. Should I call the fire department? Still no response. I wanted to call 911, but I couldn't hang up on her. I couldn't. I finally arrived at the address. Fear, disgust, and shock filled my brain. I felt water flowing down my cheeks, but it wasn't just the rain. I saw my beloved daughter in casual wear, blood staining it. One end of a noose tied around her neck, and the other around the large branch on the tree she was stuck in. I cry and cry and I just can't stop. I drop to my knees and start pounding against the floor. Why my daughter? Why would she commit suicide if that even was the case? Could someone have killed her? I close my eyes for a minute or so to try and block the tears. I flip open my cell phone, eager to call her mother and the police. I hear a faint whisper from the cell phone. The answer I've long awaited. Cut the rope, Daddy. Have you ever hated someone so much that the only thing you want to do is to put them through misery and pain? If so, you have come to the right place. This curse was used on Japanese spies that went rogue in the ages of the samurai and is still used by secret organizations today as a form of unnoticeable torture. The target will be plagued by misfortune, which could range from minor injuries all the way to deadly situations from which the subject cannot escape. This was also used by the Indians, after the technique was discovered in the late 1800s. It is important not to speak about what you have done to anyone, otherwise the curse will have the opposite effect. 
This happens for reasons unknown, since its creation was originally used for wooden keys of that era, but was modified by the aforementioned secret organizations in the late 1900s to affect metal keys. To begin, you'll need one of the subject's keys. You must make sure that it is not an important key, since important keys are easily missed by owners. You might have a hard time even getting close to your victim's key ring, but after you acquire this, you'll need the following. Ash of a burnt down tree, log, sticks to capture a spirit. A silver container to make sure that the spirit does not escape while it was captured. A knife or a sharp object to anger the spirit by stabbing it while captured. Rice to make sure that the spirit can become more powerful and do more harm. A pen and piece of paper to make sure that the spirit hits the right target. Salt as a precaution to pour around the silver container so if the spirit escapes both the ash and the silver container, this will provide you with enough time to complete the ritual if the spirit is a very strong one. Water to lay the container in, maybe inside a sink or somewhere else, just as long as you can retrieve it again in a short amount of time. If you have the above mentioned, then follow the steps to begin the ritual. 1. Pour the ash into your silver container, and begin to pour the salt around the silver container. These are your three titanium walls, blocking the spirit trying to attack you. 2. Now place the key inside the ash slowly. 3. Chant, I've got a treat for you, 15 times. 4. After 5 minutes, take your knife or sharp object and stab the ash, which is now the spirit's body, 8 times, which will anger it and make it stronger. 5. Now pour the rice into the silver container. This will cause the curse effects to become stronger. 6. After pouring the rice, the spirit will be back in the container, if it could escape both the ash and silver container. 7. Write your target's name on the piece of paper, and drop it into the silver container. 8. Go to your water source, and let the container soak for 30 minutes, so you can give the spirit time to make the key its home. 9. After the 30 minutes, you should take the key out of the container slowly, and return it to where you found it. Warning. If the target dies, the spirit will come for you, so cover all openings of your house with salt. Otherwise, you might see that same key appear in your house and you'll die. It is March 21st. 1918, Picardy Sector, Somme. We have started the bombardment of Allied positions, and it is soon time to charge them right in the face. I hope majority of the Tommies will be destroyed, since I have seen what their machine guns can do to our advancing troops. Now, I must get some rest. March 22nd, 1918. The whistle blew, and we started our advance towards the Allied lines. I saw massive craters and shattered barbed wire everywhere, along with remains of dead soldiers. Or actually, I don't even know if you can call pieces like that remains anymore. There was still heavy smoke from the five hour long bombardment. I couldn't see more than 15 meters ahead of me. It was a spooky sight. As we marched, we could still hear the distant screams of suffering British and French troops. I almost pitied them. Finally, we managed to reach the trench lines, and I almost vomited when I saw the inside of the trenches. Everything around me was shattered and bodies were buried in mud and blood. Random body parts and burnt corpses were lying in all kinds of position and places. The sight was straight from hell I tell you. The smell was even worse. However, our NCO told us to keep our guard up for remaining allied troops. I just felt like dropping my rifle 
and running as far as I can from these war-torn trenches and bodies. We searched the trenches and didn't find any Allied troops alive. But we all still could hear screams and weeping. No one knew where it came from. But it covered the trenches like an oppressive blanket of death and sadness. March, date unknown, 1918. This was when everything changed. As I woke up under a good amount of rubble, I had a horrible headache. It was in pain everywhere on my body, but I felt all of my limbs and breathing was fairly easy. I was extremely confused, as I didn't remember anything about rubble collapsing on me. After a while sorting my sanity out, I started to make my way out of that pile. As I was fully out and laying on the trench floor half sitting, I looked for my comrades, but couldn't see any. I carefully stood up and called out for anyone, but no answer. Terror started to creep into me. They must have left the trenches, right? But which way? Forwards or backwards? Assuming my comrades had retreated, because of all the fresh damage to the trench and left behind equipment, I started searching my body for wound marks but all I found was few grazes and bruises in my hands. I took off my helmet to see what condition it was. Then I saw a big dent in the back of the helmet. I must have passed out because of that. It must have been an artillery hit before any combat because there was no bodies or other wounded men around. After everything seemed reasonable, I grabbed one of the rifles laying on the trench floor and started searching for others in the foggy smoke. I slowly made my way between the rubble and the pressing walls of the ruined trench. Not long after, I arrived to a lookout spot, a raised part of the trench where you could see over the trench line to the no man's land. The spot was facing towards our former positions, and so I climbed on it. I don't honestly know how to describe what I saw. It was exactly as I'd imagined. The netherworld, where demons and the Teufel lives in. The ground was almost black from the ash, and trees were scarred and covered with embers. I could not see any flat spots on the terrain. Everything was a one big mess of dirt and flames. As I imagined how beautiful and peaceful place this looked before this bloody battle, I cried a bit in shame and despair. I took some time to handle it all, and got back on my feet and kept moving. After a few minutes, I saw a trench bunker, one of those dugouts in the side of the trench. I ran towards the bunker, in hopes of any commanders, or anyone at all really. As I got closer, I felt heat and the sound of flames got louder. The bunker was burning inside. I fell to my knees, as I saw a burnt skeleton still wearing a stanhelm and grabbing a luger mouth wide open, sitting opposite to the bunker. At that point, I felt so hopeless and destroyed, like I was the only living man in the universe. Suddenly, I heard a distant scream. Not a scared scream, but horrified and long, like someone had just stepped in a bear trap and was at the same time chased by an angry bear. I gathered myself and started running towards it as fast as I could, in hopes of saving the man. I scampered through all the rubble, and after a few turns, 
I arrived to the man who most likely had let the scream. He was a British soldier, lying face down on the trench floor, surrounded by ash, but he seemed okay. Inside, I knew he was dead, but I still turned him over to check. I wish I didn't do that. The man's face was from my worst nightmares. His eyeballs were missing and scratch marks all around his eye sockets, like he had tried to take his own eyes off. His mouth was sunken and wide open, just like that skeleton I saw before. I almost had a heart attack and jolted away from the corpse. I crawled backwards until my back hit the trench wall, and at that point, my vision started to fade. I felt the sudden and strong breeze coming from the same way I came. It was very strong, unnaturally strong. I jumped when I heard someone spluttered in German, leave this place while you still can, with a mix of coughs and fizzle. I jolted my head to my side and saw a half-sitting German soldier in a small passageway I didn't see before. He looked almost as bad as the British one, but still had his eyes on, though he also had loads of scratch marks around him, and he was bleeding from them. I tried to ask what the hell had happened, but he had died already. Terror was taking me over. I had to get out of there. I stumbled up and started running again to the same way. I smelled something strong. A familiar smell of decay. I had halted immediately and didn't know if I wanted to go to the direction of the smell. I definitely wasn't returning to the two corpses either. Climbing out of the trench was not an option because of all the shattered mess of barbed wire on top. Also, almost every ladder I had seen was either broken or burnt so badly it would break. I had no idea what to do next. I didn't have my rifle anymore, and regular soldiers weren't issued a sidearm. Also, there was no leftover equipment on the ground, like there where I came from. I was absolutely defenseless against whatever killed those two men. And what's worse, it's on no one's side. As I stand there terrified and frozen, my vision starts to fade again. Everything is darkening. Suddenly my legs start working on their own and I start walking onward to the direction of the smell. As I take the next turn sanity crumbling, I see a man in the darkness of the smoke and moonlight. He is facing away from me, but appears to wear a German uniform and one of those old spiked helmets abandoned long ago from use. He looks like a corpse, but is standing up completely normal. I didn't even think about calling him out. It was a kind of accident. Automatic reaction. You know how you just answer yes if someone calls your name? That kind of automatic reaction. The man doesn't turn. My vision is getting worse and worse. All I can focus on is the man. After a few seconds my vision starts to return and I see soldiers standing beside the walls of the trench, enemy and friendly alike, as long as I can see just two walls of men. They all have the same expression, empty eyes and mouth wide open. I feel heavy rain falling on me. I start to sob heavily and just want to die already. I fall to my knees and my vision goes completely black for a moment. Next thing I remember is facing that man 
an old uniform and spiked helmet. We both are standing on the no man's land, surrounded by thick fog. He is far away from me, but still, it feels like he's right in front of me. His face is the same as others, but so much worse. The colors of his uniform and skin is grayer than normal. His head is slightly tilted. We just stand there staring at each other. I don't know what he was, but I assume some kind of ghost of war. I have no idea why he didn't kill me like all others. Maybe he tried to teach us some kind of lesson. Suddenly, I realize the situation and start sprinting as fast as I can away from him through the war-torn landscape. It is starting to rain again. I felt my legs giving up, then I fell over. Laying there facing the sky and rain falling on me. I don't know if I was even breathing. All I felt was extreme sadness and exhaustion. I think I passed out in the no man's land and got back to our starting trenches because next thing I remember is my comrades trying to calm me down and the rest is just recovery from the battle. I was sent to a field hospital and stated I have a worst case shell shock. So I was sent back home. Now it is 21st of March, 1938. And how do I know all this is true and not just a dream? My former comrades told the nurses, I would came from the no man's land in thick fog and completely dead looking. Clothes torn and covered in mud. I don't know what the hell happened, but I received a letter from the front, stating the trench we charged was completely empty and abandoned. I was the last man alive who had charged that grid. Even the Allies asked us after the war what the hell happened that day, but no one knew. I don't know how much I've imagined things, and if there really was a ghost rambling around those trenches, but one thing I'm certain of. I will never forget what I saw that day. The French government has closed the area in fear of non-detonated explosives. I think it's best like that. Some really terrifying stuff has been happening to me. I don't know how to handle it. I'm getting too ahead of myself though. I should start with something like, Hi, my name is Jacob. I'm 16 and I live in the suburbs of LA. Too cliche of an intro? I don't know. I'm too frightened to care right now. It all started a week ago. I was at some shop somewhere near the outside of LA, somewhere off some remote highway. My mom decided she wanted to stop there after coming back from a short camping trip with the family. After arriving there, we saw that it was a knick-knack shop and a moderately sized one at that. Walking inside, an ominous feeling dropped over me almost like a feeling when it's hot outside of the pickle and step into a cool building and the rush of coolness hits you. Only this time, with eeriness. I looked around, examining all the odd and somewhat normal looking items. That's when something weird happened. A flash seemed to illuminate the right side of my field of vision. I looked over, but there was nothing shiny. Just a book that had a crazily ornate heart cover. It had silver and gold lining with metallic designs on the face of it. For some reason, it began to draw me in, like I wanted it, 
and honestly, I kinda did. I found the decoration on the front very cool, due to the style of decoration, which I can't really describe. Just the kind of style that drew me in. I inspected the title of the book, and it was titled, The Darkest Shadow. I was intrigued by the book, and having a love of creepy stuff like this, I decided to grab it and take it to the cashier. Touching it was a mistake. As soon as I grabbed it, an intense feeling of dread or fear, I'm not even sure, loomed over me. After about six seconds or so, the feeling just ascended off me, or most of it at least, because I still felt uneasy. I tried to ignore it, and just figured it was hormones or the eerie feeling the shop had already given me to begin with. Is this for sale? I asked the cashier, arriving at the counter. You want that book? Are you sure? The cashier replied, a sound of only what I can describe as fear in his voice. Um, yeah, is that a problem? I questioned, quite surprised with his unenthusiasm to sell it to me, almost as if he knew something I didn't. No, not at all. Take it. Have it for free. The cashier said, not even touching the book. Oh, okay. Thanks. I smiled, happy but confused. Bye-bye then. The cashier said on my way out. Or at least that's what I think he said. Who cares though? I had my book, and I was pretty excited to get to reading. I haven't read a good thrilling book in a while, and this was free, so... Hey what's not to be excited about. For some reason though, I couldn't shake off that I wasn't sure if he said bye bye then or something else. I swear he could have said bye bye Jen. We got home and I had some dinner, tacos, the best. Sometime around 8 p.m., I decided to start reading the book. I grabbed it off my nightstand next to my bed. I pried it open and began to read. It had the thick smell of age to match the yellowing paper. The text was still readable, so I didn't mind. The book was actually pretty cool and interesting. It was about a girl who had drowned in a bathroom. After her husband found out, she had an affair with another man. The man cut off the light bulb while the mother was washing their 12-month-old baby in the tub. The man drowned the girl in the tub in front of the daughter and then proceeded to drown the baby due to the guilt and realization of what he had done. He slit his throat and bled out. That's all I've read so far. I look at the clock. 12.42 a.m. I should get some sleep, I thought. I stood the book up on the nightstand, hoping the book would make my room more decorative. I turned my mini lamp off, and my room was flooded with pitch blackness. For some reason, I began to feel insecure, like something was watching me from the closet across my room. I closed my eyes and try to shake off the feeling. I figured I was feeling this way because I read a scary book until 12.42 a.m. It wasn't really a good idea, but I was just so drawn to this book that I almost couldn't put it down. My eyes had adjusted to the blackness of the room, and now I could make out the object in my room like my bookshelf. My Xbox, TV, my desk, and computer. I could see the outline of my sliding closet door. Something caught my eye, though. The book on my shelf was producing a shadow that stretched to the roof of my room. 
I don't know how. Seeing as my windows were completely covered by the shades, so there was absolutely no source of light shining through the window. There was no light source at all. Yet the book had a shadow growing out of it. I could tell because there was a shadow-like shade emerging from it that was a darker shade than the rest of my room. As I stared at it, I realized it looked like the shadow of a human. That scared the crap out of me. I guess I just had set it up oddly on my nightstand. That's all. It moved. I held still, petrified. I swear it moved. There was no doubt in my mind that made me think it didn't. It looked like a girl with long hair. I was scared stiff. The shadow's head slowly jerked sideways, as if looking at me in a two-dimensional form. I turned in my bed, scared that it was clearly aware I was there. I closed my eyes and did not open them until somehow I fell asleep. The next morning, the day went through normally. It was a Sunday, so I didn't do much. I decided to give the book another shot. I grabbed it from off my desk and read and read. I couldn't set it down. I kept seeing the girl jerking her head towards me over and over in my mind, and I couldn't set the book down. Eventually, dinner came. I don't know how. What I ate doesn't really matter, so I'm not going to go into detail about it. I decided to get sleep early tonight. Reading the book didn't sound like a very good idea, so I didn't do it. I turned the light off, and pitch blackness flooded the room again. Nothing wrong had happened this time. Once my eyes had adjusted, I saw the shadow again. Oh God, I thought. I don't want to do this again. Suddenly, there was a faint sound coming from outside of my room. I listened harder, and it sounded like a baby crying. I looked up to see the shadow, but it was gone. Huh. Must have been my imagination the whole time. I looked down at the floor and yelled. The girl's shadow was rising out of the ground, its head facing towards the floor. Oh crap. Oh god. This is terrible. Thoughts were blurting through my head and then the shadow jerked its head towards me. I couldn't move. I was stuck. Its empty, lifeless eyes pierced into mine. The baby crying grew louder, and the girl came closer, emitting a multi-pitched demonic-like laugh. Her movement forward emitted a sound like nothing you'd ever expect. It was the sound that would emit, like if you removed the game cartridge out of a device while it's still playing. I suddenly regained movement. I grabbed the book and ran for my life past the girl. I ran to our kitchen and grabbed the lighter out of the junk drawer. I threw the book in the stainless steel sink, which was dry at the moment. That way, I wouldn't burn down the house. I lit the book on fire and watched it burn. A feeling of joy washed over me. This should do it, I thought. I felt kind of proud. I really hoped this would get rid of the ghost. Without warning, the sink blasted on, full power. It put the fire out almost instantly. No, 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 no. I cried in grief. I picked up the book and opened it up. Only... The pages were blank, confused. I flipped through the pages until I came across one that had an eerie girl grinning up at me with the words, you shouldn't have done that, printed on it. Full of fear and rage, 
I ran outside in the night. Looking back at the house, I saw the girl grinning at me through the window. I turned my head and ran. I ran as fast as I could. My feet hurt because I didn't have any shoes or socks, and I also didn't know where I was going. I looked around and saw a well. I remember it because anytime we'd drive around the suburbs to go to downtown LA, we'd pass it. I ran to the well and chucked the book as hard as I could. It hit the side of the well and dropped down and splashed in the distance. I sighed with relief and ran back home. No sign of the girl. No crying baby. It was quiet. I checked on my parents, and they were still asleep. I don't know how they didn't hear all the commotion. I went back to my room to go to sleep. I inspected the room and there was nothing out of the usual, especially no shadows anywhere. I felt the weight lifted off me, like this evil had been eradicated, or at least unbound from me. I smiled and went to sleep. The next morning, my mom said we were going downtown to do some heavy-duty shopping. Awesome, maybe I can get some games, I said enthusiastically. And my mom rolled her eyes and smiled. Come on, let's go. We both got in the car and I hopped in the front seat. My mom started up the ignition and pulled out of the driveway. We turned down the street and drove down the road to downtown LA. I looked to the side and something caught my eye. I saw the well, and right behind it was the girl standing in a freaky, crippled-looking position, her head cocked almost completely sideways, smiling at me. I held in my breath and swung my head towards the front windshield. My mom looked over me, confused. Then her phone buzzed. I jumped, scared for my life. Jacob, relax. It's just my phone. Can you pick it up for me? I'm driving. It's probably your dad. I sighed and replied, Yeah, sure. I picked up the phone and hit the answer call button. Hello? I said. Then my blood ran cold. At the other side of the line, I heard a distinct female voice rasp. You shouldn't have done that. 